In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, tonight, I'd like to begin with a special prayer. The prayer cards can be found in the uh, front lobby of the front foyer of the church, the Narthax. It's a Holy Spirit prayer for revival, and I do believe that it is truly inspired and a, a good point of meditation for us all and for our parishes, wherever we may be. Breathe in us, Holy Spirit, that you may inspire our thoughts, words, and actions. Move in us, Holy Spirit, that you may bring revival to our country, our families, our schools, our churches, and our communities. Inflame our hearts, Holy Spirit, to desire holiness. Enkindle in us an excitement to know the Eucharistic heart of Jesus and to spread his message of love to all. We need you to come down on your people. We long for a renewed Pentecost where you will be put in the first place in all of our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Amen. This prayer was written by one of our parishioners. The prayer card was designed by one of our parishioners in the Eucharistic host here in the prayer card, you'll see the Holy Spirit dove that uh, floats above our altar, inserted right in there. All right, so uh, it's very much connected to our parish. Uh, and you know, it, it, it works very nicely in light of what we are talking about tonight. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to remind you, uh, Father Michael, from the Sanctuary of Mary, one of the vocations fathers, is here with us tonight. So please feel free to avail yourself of going to confession at any time. It is never rude to get up during the talk and go to Father Michael, go to the sacrament of penance, receive that renewal we need, receive that healing, receive that regeneration in the blood of Christ. But uh, as I was saying about this prayer, you know, right now, there is truly a uh, charismatic, spirit-led revival that is occurring here in our country. Uh, and just like the Duquesne revival, and just like the Azusa Street revival, and all those other revivals uh, that came uh, in the early 20th century, in the mid-20th century, um, it's starting again. And it's starting at a university, which is pretty cool, college, campus. And I want as much of that revival to come to this parish as possible, as much of the Holy Spirit can come here as well. We want that to happen. We want, need that to happen. It is something that we should all be praying for, something that we should be uh, seeking out in our prayer, to, for our, like this prayer says very much for our country, family, schools, churches, and communities. Uh, we all need the Holy Spirit. We all need that inspiration. And I definitely encourage you uh, to take one of these prayer cards, pray with your family. Uh, maybe uh, not in place of grace, but at the time of grace before meals. What a lovely prayer to say. What a great little thing that that would be. Uh, you know, Whenever we reach new levels of depravity, new levels of emptiness, new levels of thirst, we find that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon us and inspire us and give us everything that we need. So definitely turn to the Holy Spirit at this time. Turn to the Holy Spirit at this time. Um, <clears throat> Very, very important. Very, very important. So tonight's talk is titled Sitio. It's Latin. It means I thirst. Or, and I actually prefer, I am a thirst. I am a thirst. Let me th no, think about that for a second. They are the words spoken by our Lord upon the cross, one of the seven last words of Christ. Christ does not seek to simply say, I am thirsty. 
please give me something to drink. In saying, I thirst, I am a thirst, he says that he draws all thirst, all desire for refreshment upon himself, who thirsts for the glory of the kingdom of God, for the eternal peace and nourishment of body and soul. It's exactly what we were just praying for in this Holy Spirit prayer, isn't it? It's exactly what we were just praying for. <clears throat> the completion, the fulfillment, and exhausting within himself of all human longing, desire, pain, suffering, desolation, emptiness, yearning. This is what Christ draws upon himself in these words, I am a thirst. In our own day, Thanks to the rise of great suffering and times of despair, we see historically, uh, an example would be maybe the Holocaust, which is still, believe it or not, something contemporary. That is not too far remote in the overall history of humanity. But right now, we are dealing with wars. We are dealing with famines. We are dealing with all sorts of natural disasters. We are dealing with an economic crisis that if you caught Robert Kiyosaki's interview on Neil Cavuto today, let me tell you something. It's not going to look pretty over the next few months, maybe years. Some people, some economists are predicting, predicting that the economic situation that we are in right now will be worse than the Great Depression, where people will literally have their homes, everything that they own taken out from underneath of them because literally the banks are going to be insolvent. And that's already happened now twice in the last two days. So no exaggeration here. No exaggerations here. It's happening. It's happening. Economic instability. Then there is the socio-political instability. We see that in our nation. I mean, has our country been this polarized? since the Civil War? I mean, you literally have Jane Fonda calling for the murder of pro-life people on The View last week. I mean, we're talking about polarized. We're not talking about, you know, just people not agreeing, but ultimately capable of making a compromise. Uh-uh, we're talking about absolute polarization. The way things were at the time of the Civil War. That's the socio-political situation we are in right now. You can't get anyone and everyone to agree on anything. We're also dealing with the fact that there is a cultural, anthropological revolution going on right now, where people are so sexually confused that you literally have men and women not know if they are a man or a woman. I mean, we're talking about confusion of an epic and fundamental matter. And then amidst all of this, we got the Catholic Church not knowing if it wants to maintain teaching the faith that it is always taught, that there is a lack of stability in the church as well. 
You only have to hear about the German Synodal Way. You only have to hear about the bishops in Belgium. You only have to read Cardinal McElroy's letter. You only have to read about what Cardinal Hollerich is talking about changing in regards to teachings of the church. And you would be amazed. You'd say, well, wait a second. Is this the faith that I always knew? Is this the faith that I have professed for all these years? What's going on? So when we talk about instability, if we're talking about whether it be at a macro level or it be at the individual person's level, there is a total reality of instability, confusion, an unsettled spirit that's affecting every single person's heart. Every single person's mind, even the view of how they treat or recognize their own body. And so with a fractured point of view, a perspective that sees humanity not simply in its weakness, but in a desolate and desperate manner, that's, what we're, that's where we're at. You know, after the bliss and it is a bliss of childhood, is lost, we come to see the harsh reality of the world. It's a cold, materialistic, reducible, estranged, warehouse-like indifferentism. And we react to this realization, we react to it with sadness. We see the fading, passing glory of all that we once clung to and the realization of the idols that we once held with great esteem as having mere feet of clay. We lose hope and enter a place of depression and or remorse. No longer is the world we live in a warm and human place but a factory of humanity for the exploitation and goals of those in power. And this is a, this is a, a heart-wrenching reality that the youth, definitely, they, they never had that childhood bliss. After my generation, those who grew up they already grew, they grew up in the instability of 9-11 and its aftermath, of the economic instability that we have experienced every year since 9-11. We, they have grown in the political instability that we have seen in this country and in this world since 9-11. When I grew up, the United States of America was this bastion of stability. Economically, politically, socially, it was the country that had Chuck Norris and Arnold Schwarzenegger defending it and no one was gonna take it down. And if you were in a tower in LA and it was taken hostage, Bruce Willis was there for you. <laughs> but that's not the America we live in anymore. That kind of stability, that kind of strength, that's not present at all. And it's not present anywhere in the world. The whole world is just so fractured. Weak, not in a good way. Weak because it's given in to evil and it's allowed everything to be so divisive, so polarized, so negative. Cold and despair. 
Well, this realization scares many and creates despair in many more. The pandemic certainly finished that out. If anybody thought that there was something strong to hold on to, the pandemic got rid of any sort of clutch, any sort of pillar that you ever thought existed in your life. Some will seek religion. Yet do they for the right reasons? Perfect example of this. How full churches were after the pandemic. At least ours was. How full. And now you start to see some of the families fall back into their previous lukewarm, tepid spirituality. Where, so do you want to go to religious head or to mass this weekend? Well, you sat through family faith formation, so you know what? Let's just go to breakfast. We don't need to go to mass. That was said last Sunday. People don't think I know these things. <laughs> you see, that's the falling backwards, what St. Paul calls backsliding. So did they come to church because they love God or because they feared death because of a pandemic? Ooh, important point. Some others will turn to agnosticism as they no longer know if God could have created such a place. Others will turn to atheism. So agnosticism says they don't know. They don't know if a God exists. Atheism is the positive affirmation that he doesn't exist. And as they cannot understand why a God would create such a cold, unforgiving, and unloving world and resign themselves to believe that there is then no God. In the once viewed as liberating words of Nietzsche, God is dead. They will see nothing but cold, hard facts, numbers, and measurements. And they will see no greater significance beyond this life. Life for them is merely a struggle for enjoyment until death, and at death all ceases. Truly, life is absurd. The great sage of Hebrew wisdom literature, Kohirath, sums it up quite precisely. O oh, vanity of vanities, all things are vanity. Still others who may believe in God will feel that they are alone in the world and they'll seek pleasure, a certain type of quasi-Christian, quasi-hedonistic way of life in order to fulfill their longing for consolation, comfort, and warmth in their life. This is the person who is very altruistic. A do-gooder. But, so I have sex outside of marriage. So I masturbate and watch pornography. So I drink a lot. So I don't always go to church because I prefer to sleep in and watch movies and have a big pancake breakfast with my family. So I do a little bit of drugs, but it's like not anything bad. I mean, I'm not doing anything crazy. So I, you know, use really foul language when I'm joking around with the guys and I do this. I really just don't care because, you know what, God's a cool dude and he's going to forgive. And that's what he's all about is mercy. So it doesn't really matter. I'm all, it's all good, all right? I'm not hurting anybody. They see God as good and creator of all, but then sort of abandon them to make the best they can of their life. When, what in philosophy one may call a deist. They believe in God, but then after God created everything, he kind of just becomes remote. And we just have to now go about doing the 
best we can. And you know, that's all that matters. I did my best, all right? I gave it my best. But did you? If you're not living virtue, if you're not living a life of prayer, penance, fasting, almsgiving, service, like we talked about in our first talk, if you're not living that kind of life, are you really giving it your best? For myself, I had this experience of seeing the world for what it can be, a cold, dark place of misery and fracture, quite young. Maybe that's why I'm a priest. The first time I saw the world like this, I was only in the second grade, about eight years old. Again and again, I saw the emptiness that one who embraces the ways of the world creates in their life, and I saw something more, something outside myself, and the ever-fading beauty of this world for something that does not change, something that fulfills and brings warmth to the soul, that provides fulfillment and peace. Fulfillment and peace. You know what it was that I saw in the eighth grade? I mean, the, the, the second grade when I was eight years old? I saw teachers already back then teaching relativism. I didn't know it by that name. But I saw them teaching moral relativism. Well, what Sally thinks is good is perfectly fine for Sally. And what Johnny thinks is good is perfectly fine for Johnny. So there's no such thing as truth? There's no such thing as this is good for everyone? There's no such thing as right from wrong? See, while my parents might not uh, win great awards for the fact that I was watching action movies as a kid. They did the best thing for me. They did the absolute best thing by letting me watch those action movies. Because in the 80s and the 90s, every single action movie made very clear the distinction between right and wrong, good and evil, truth and false. And so yes, Watching the movie Delta Force at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, etc. 40. <laughs> Still my favorite movie. I cry and watching the movie Delta Force all the time. I, I cry my eyes out. It's such a great movie. Anyway. But you see, There was a very clear message of right and wrong. Good and evil. These days, you turn on the TV, you put on these cartoons for these kids. There's never right from wrong, good from evil. Everything's good. Everything's good. And through conflict resolution, we're going to just show how everybody can be right even when they are polar opposite. No one can ever be wrong. Nobody ever has to really apologize because no one is wrong. So why do I need forgiveness if everything I do is right? Why do I need redemption if everything I do is good? Don't discipline your children. You'll wreck their self-confidence. How about you put them in their room and lock the door and teach them what it means to have self-control? You see, this is... People don't realize just how damaging these seemingly little insignificant things are. But I saw it when I was in the second grade. And I rejected it. 
Just like Jesus in Revelation 6, I wanted to vomit this lukewarm gobbledygook right out of my mouth. And then I was the one getting in trouble because I was like, no, this is right, that's wrong. This is good, that's bad. This is true, that's false. You're wrong. And when I said that to the kid, they cried because they couldn't handle it because we were raising snowflakes already. But you see, by that deterioration of truth, of goodness, that's where I recognize, no, no, no. You know what they're doing? They're just making these people into little homogenized drones. I recognized it. I couldn't say it the way I now do. I couldn't verbalize it. But I knew it was sick. So where did I find that perfection? Where did I find that transcendence, that sense of meaning and direction? I found it for the first time in my life at St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church in Milford, Pennsylvania. I found it in the homilies and the way the liturgy was celebrated by Father Gerald F. I found in the warmth of the color, the music, the art, the architecture, and the actions of transcendent communion with the other, God, that peace and harmony that I longed for. It meant dying to self, <coughs> to live within the life of someone else, someone who could provide you with an everlasting joy and peace, someone who can lift you out of the mire to a realm of life-giving and fulfilling relationship. Two very simple things I want to talk about real quick. Architecture and ritual. Architecture. During the Reformation, the so-called Enlightenment period of philosophy, man was viewed as the center of his own reality. The height of existence is human existence. It is our human experience that gives us knowledge, the phenomenological, that which can be gleaned without presupposition by the empirical senses, the solely observable data, empirical data, that which is learned through the five senses. Man, I use this term in the inclusive sense from here on out, is the center of knowledge as it is in knowing man that mankind understands itself and the world around us. The architecture of uh, Renaissance churches made man the, uh, the center of his own reality. Whereas Gothic art, because the roofs were low, the walls were closed in more. So if, the, if you were to stand in the middle of the church and put your arms out of, an, of a Renaissance church, you're the middle. You're the middle. In Gothic churches, in Baroque churches, in Catholic churches, whether they're Romanesque or uh, Basilica architecture or whatever they might be, the ceiling is so high, the walls are so far apart, everything expresses length and breadth, and you are a little ant amidst a great reality of which God is enveloping you. Because it's God's grandeur, His glory, His greatness that is overwhelming you. Let's talk about ritual. The music and the art of celebration, the gracefulness of movement and gestures, brought me to something outside of myself, to the other, to God. I realized in the expression of this ritual an order of being that transcends our ordinary human experience. It spoke to me of an unchanging beauty. A way that speaks with words that are not simply that of man, but that elevate us into a communion of being 
that transcends this world and gives this world its purpose. It was prayer, which von Balthasar explains as exchange between God and the soul. It is a transcendent experience of mystical communion with that which was outside of myself, while at the same time being the very center, the determining core of my being. That relationship to prayer, what we call the virtue of religion. So the darkness and dire of the world was not something that I could easily put behind me. It is still ever-present. At times, I listen to songs that even express the vast emptiness which I once felt. A sort of reminiscence. I feel the desolation and loneliness of being lost amidst a wide world which wants nothing to do with me. I see the woe that lurks about every street corner of the foul and festering wounds that this world <coughs> suffers. Yet it was now being seen transformed. What was darkness had become light, cold, warm meaningless, significant. A choice to be in communion with him had been made. A free choice made over and over again. It was at my confirmation that I felt God's ever-abiding presence fill me and renew me. I literally felt a burning sensation throughout my entire body at my confirmation. I only ever felt that again when I was ordained a deacon It took the void that I had felt and nourished. It was an experience of a transcendent communion of love, a burning upon and within me. Yet many who have had different, similar, or the same experiences that I have still remain timid to enter into communion with Him, to follow Christ. They fear that the following of Christ means the suffocation surrendering of their freedom. They feel that to live in Christ means to lose one's own identity, their individuality, and that they will have to conform to a singular model, that they will no longer have control over their own lives and decisions. They fear they will lose out on their being able to be spontaneous, that fun will no longer be had, that they will lose their personalities. They see following Christ as a loss of their freedom, a loss of that which no one has the right to take away from them. They dislike the notion of having to obey an authority. We see this. We see this in many societies and how society promotes sexual liberation and abortion rights. If anyone heard the Jane Fonda interview on The View last week, what did she say? We fought and we got our rights as women and now they're trying to take it away from us. They're trying to subjugate us again. And we're not going to do it and if we have to murder, we will. Wow. Wow, you see? This is exactly what I'm talking about. It's this false notion of freedom. You see, the United States gets freedom wrong from the get-go. From the get-go. It talks about freedoms of, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. FDR deteriorates that ability to have freedom even more with his four basic freedoms, which are freedoms for, I mean, it's freedom from, freedom from, freedom from want, freedom from this and that. 
True freedom is a freedom exercised for something. It's a freedom for the good. It's a freedom for the truth. It's a freedom for love. It's a freedom for justice. Not of, because it's, if it's of, then that means that unless a government gives you that freedom, you don't actually got it. And if it's a freedom from, it means that there has to be a power, an authority, that's capable of delivering you from whatever that thing is. But what we have is we already have freedom. Freedom isn't something that we need a government to proscribe or enumerate. Freedom is not something that we need an authority or power to deliver us from. We are free because Christ on the cross has liberated us from everything. And thus our freedom can now be exercised for whatever it needs to be exercised for. There is no simple response to this problem of people who feel that their freedom will be limited if they follow Christ. It is true that one who enters into full communion with the Catholic Church is obliged to follow the Church's teachings in faith and morals. In fact, in every dialogue with other Christian communities, the single most difficult issue is not so much the different particular teachings of the faith, the concept of authority. Authority, though, does not exist in order to destroy one's freedom. The word Catholic means universal and signifies a collection of culturally diverse and different individuals, as different as night as to, is today, but all of us united in that same one faith, the same sacraments, and by the same shepherds, for the same purpose, the salvation of souls. That's the mission of the church. And so the use of authority is meant to grow the church, to help people come to know and love Jesus Christ and freely receive and accept that free gift of salvation given to us by Jesus Christ. That's what authority is used for. Following Christ, therefore, is not about the subjugation and loss of one's identity, but the bringing to fulfillment of one's individuality. It is God himself who gave us our personalities. It is then in God and not mankind that our individual personal person is brought to its perfection and completion. It is in Christ that man finds his fulfillment. In Christ we become truly free, free to love, and free to be brought to perfection through communion with him who knows us better than anyone else. I mean, who knows us better than God? And you might say, well, wait a second, if I've got to follow Christ, I've got to follow the Ten Commandments. But let's face it, who has violated one of the Ten Commandments and wound up free? Free from drama, free from stress, free from anxiety, free from grief, free from fear? No one. No one. The only way to be free is to follow the Lord God because that is what provides us freedom. I realize, I realize that, you know, that is a statement that seems totally backwards. However, freedom is only coming when we place ourselves in obedience to Jesus Christ and His law for us. It's a paradox, but it is the reality. But if it only brings me back to the mire, the darkness, <clears throat> sorry. So I'm asking, am I really realizing my freedom if I make a decision that goes against God? Yes, if you believe that to be free is to be able to decide not God. 
To sure. But if it only brings me back to the mire, the darkness and the cold of the self-consumed will, then is it liberating? Or only binding me to the world I want to escape, the sadness that once previously found transformation into joy of Christ? Am I only fooling myself? Am I only creating a virtual reality of bliss out of my desire for work? completeness, or am I actually achieving transformation, a life of fulfillment and meaning? So sitio, I thirst, I am a thirst. I thirst for meaning. I thirst for peace and serenity. I thirst for love and warmth. My life has no meaning in and of itself. It has no purpose, value, or worth if it is only going to extinguish at death. What misery to live if only to die. Why then be at all? The greatness of God is in the fact that our yearning is fulfilled by Him. For God sent His only Son to die upon the cross for us, that we may no longer thirst, but drink from the pure side of Christ from which flowed blood and water, the Eucharist and baptism. It is from His side we drink and drink abundantly, that from the depths to the apex of our being we may be filled. Through him, with him, and in him, we find our meaning. Christ makes life worth living. So, I thaw thirst for meaning and direction. That's where I hear God call my vocation. I hear him call me, and I say yes. I have the humility and the courage to say yes to God. Fill what he is calling me to do with my life. I thirst for knowledge. As one, uh, one of my formation advisors in the seminary, Monsignor David Bohr of the Diocese of Scranton, he used to always say there are two insatiable thirsts, knowledge and love. Well, I thirst for knowledge. Because knowledge seeks to know the truth. I thirst then for counsel. Right judgment. Because by thirsting for counsel, for right judgment, I then have the ability, knowing the truth, to discern good or evil. Good or evil for myself, in my own personal discernments, many times every single day, and in dis helping others, counseling them to know right from wrong, good from evil. Truth from false, which is going to also require wisdom and understanding. Wisdom, which teaches us is that practical knowledge how to fulfill the law of God in our life. And understanding, which gives us a deep, uh, deeper insight into how to live our relationship with God how to interpret the faith, how to interpret divine revelation, how then to apply it in our life. That's what's understanding. And that's obviously going to help us grow in our ability to counsel ourselves and others. But to do that is also going to require fortitude, the courage, the courage to what? to do the good and be truthful in our own life and to go to others and to admonish our brothers and sisters to make sure that they're doing what is true and good as well. And this is going to also then need reverence, the right worship of God. Because if we're not worshiping God properly, the way that we are meant to worship Him, in spirit and in truth, with our full body, heart, mind, body, and soul, especially in the Eucharist, especially at Mass, then what's going to happen? Receiving all the sacraments, going to confession, to confess our sins, going to confession, to be healed, 
from the hurt that we've caused ourselves and others, or that we have experienced that was, was imposed upon us by others, to be renewed, refreshed, revived by the Holy Spirit, by washed clean in the precious blood of Jesus Christ, it's going to require that reverence. It's going to require us to be truly prayerful, as von Balthasar said, because true prayer is relationship between God and the soul. It's the communion of God and the soul. We lift up our hearts, and that's why the interior apostle of the soul is more comes primary before we engage in the external works of the act of apostolate. And then, of course, we need one in it all, which expresses our thirst for love, wonder and awe, holy fear, which says, I have experienced the glory of God. I have seen his glory. I have experienced that transcendent glory in my life, his, a foretaste of heaven. I have experienced him. And having experienced him, I don't want to do anything to create an impediment between me and him. I don't want any stumbling blocks. I want him to plow the path and make it smooth and direct. I don't want any side paths. I just want to take the straight and narrow right to Jesus. I want no sin in my life because I don't want to lose that glory. I don't want to lose that joy. I don't want to lose that peace. I don't want to lose that meaning. The warmth that has come into my life because I have found meaning in Jesus Christ. I have found purpose in Jesus Christ. I have found direction for my life in Jesus Christ. I don't want to lose that. I don't want to surrender that to the devil. I, I, I want to keep that. That's what wonder and awe is all about. Our insatiable thirst for love. That keeps us stay on, on that path, on the straight and narrow. And that fills us with hope that when we do fall, we can confess our sins and immediately be restored. So once again, let us pray this prayer to the Holy Spirit because you're going to realize just how deep this really is. You're going to realize just how deep this prayer really is. Breathe in us, Holy Spirit, that you may inspire our thoughts, words, and actions. Move in us, Holy Spirit, that you may bring revival to our country our families, our schools, our churches, and our communities. Inflame our hearts, Holy Spirit, to desire holiness. Enkindle in us an excitement to know the Eucharistic heart of Jesus and to spread his message of love to all. We need you to come down on your people. We long for a renewed Pentecost where you will be put in the first place in all of our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Amen. Questions, comments, concerns, fears, or anxieties? Which there should be none of, now that you know it all. <laughs> now that you know that in Jesus every answer is given. Every bit of knowledge, understanding, wisdom, counsel that you need is given. 
every bit of love is given. Yes, Nancy. Now I'm a little depressed. <laughs> now you're a little depressed. Why? So, for the sake of the video, all the different bad stuff that's going on in the world, scary, it's scary. All the different kind of bad stuff that's going on in the world seems to be doom and gloom. But if uh, we are in union with Jesus Christ, doesn't matter. I mean, let's look at the apocalypse, the second coming, the parousia. We heard it's going to be a mess. It's going to be horrifying. There's plagues. There's the destruction of all this stuff. There's the rising of demons and beasts and the horror of Babylon and all this craziness. But for those of us who are with Jesus, none of that matters. None of that matters. The whole world could go to hell, literally. Like it will at the second coming. And we're fine. We're fine. And then we have what? The greatest glory the greatest joy, the greatest happiness, the greatest peace that we could ever constantly fail to imagine. So what is there to fear? Nothing at all. We just need to be in union with Jesus. When I lost my grandmother on December 8th this past year, Mac of Conception, When I first got into the funeral home, there was, I started crying at one point. I gotta be honest, okay? But by and large, I really didn't cry. I didn't have any fear or anxiousness. I was pretty much calm, cool, and collected, at peace the whole darn time. Why? Because of our faith. Recently, um, a woman in this parish, very involved, especially with our food pantry and stuff historically and whatnot, she, um, she lost her husband. She has been in total peace. Why? Because of our faith. If you believe the sacrament of the anointing and sick forgives sins, and you believe in the apostolic part and takes away all time and purgatory, boom, that's beautiful. All this, if you believe in the sacraments, if you believe in what we say about those who are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, then like Monsignor Brown used to always say, the greatest gift that you can ever give those that you leave behind is a holy death. Because no one in your family ever has to worry. No one has to worry. Oh, I hope that they're not in hell. I hope that they're all right. I hope everything's okay. If we believe in the communion of saints, we remember that opening line in the wake lit liturgy that I think is the best line in the entire funeral rites that we have in the Catholic Church. That we believe that the relationships that we sow in love and affection in this life are not unraveled by death. Hello? My aunt, I mean my grandmother, who passed, lived in a horrible place called Long Island. <laughs> From Branchville, it would take four horrible more hours stuck in the pit, better known as the Cross Bronx Expressway, but it's the pit. Stuck for 45 minutes minimally at the George Washington Bridge. I mean, like, so, like, moly. You know, I mean, just you just sit there, 
And you have every single New York license plate driving on the curb and whatnot because, you know, they're unruly, uncivilized people. And you know it's true because it's the blessed sacraments right there. But you see, it was a long ride. It's a miserable ride. Guess what? Now she's here with me right now, saying, stop talking so parally about New York. <laughs> you got to remember, I really don't dislike New York, by the way. You know, like 98% of my family lives there. <laughs> no, but you see, like, there's no distance. Distance isn't an issue. That relationship that was sown in love and affection here didn't end. It changed. It changed for the better. Because now I can be anywhere and talk to my grandmother, receive the guidance and the love and affection from her. So why feel like fear death? You see, if we have this relationship with God and we truly believe what our faith teaches us, then we should, there should be no one crying at a funeral. I know that's hard. I know that's hard. But if we really believe, I mean, that's why the early Christians, as they went to their death, were singing songs as they were being burned at the stake. Singing songs as they were being mauled and eaten by lions. Singing songs as they were being crucified. Saying prayers and singing songs, glorifying God. Why? Because death did not have the final say over them. And so no matter what happens to this world, fear not. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Does that help, Nancy? A little. A little? <laughs> All right, I think it's time for benediction.
praises. Blessed be God, blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, virgin and mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. All praise and all thanksgiving to everyone of God. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. All praise and all thanksgiving to everyone of God. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. All praise and all May the heart of Jesus in the most blessed sacrament be praised, adored, and loved with grateful affection at every moment in all the tabernacles of the world, even unto the end of time. Amen. Stop making fun of New Jersey. <laughs> 